Hey there, my dear students uh, and my colleagues, members of the fraternity of physiology and medicine. Hope you all are doing well, uh, staying safe and healthy. These are the pandemic times, and uh, uh, the pandemic has ravaged most of the most parts of the world. Um, so let's stand united uh, along with uh, our uh, healthcare workers the members of the fraternity who are uh, in the forefront of this battle. Uh, I must apologize that the videos are not coming uh, with, uh, with a regular frequency, lots of uh, obstacles, but I assure you from this point onward, uh, I'll try to bring out the content uh, at a much higher frequency. Right, so today's topic is about the coronary circulation. Actually, uh, I have made a video on this previously, but it was only a part of this particular topic. That is, how there is a tissue pressure gradient across the wall of the heart and how it affects the coronary circulation. So, it was just a particular section. Now, this video is going to be about uh, entirety about the coronary circulation means we will discuss lots of special features of uh, this particular circulation. So, let us begin uh, the topic itself. I will divide it into three parts. First will be introduction and functional anatomy. Then we will discuss those special characteristics and then the last part would be uh, the most important part actually because uh, as I have mentioned in the introduction, about one third of all deaths in the affluent society result from the coronary artery disease. Uh, heart attacks commonly called or in medical term uh, myocardial infarction. So, it is very important to understand why for instance such a scenario or such a condition of heart attack or myocardial infarction exists only in the case of this particular organ system. I mean, why do we uh, come across heart attacks or myocardial infarction? I mean, it is quite obvious that heart attack would occur in the heart, but then why other organ systems uh, do not suffer from such a scenario, such commonly? Uh, I mean, uh, there is uh, the other organ system that is brain, CNS, which does show cerebrovascular accidents. But this is very, very special. So, we need to understand uh, why specifically heart has to suffer uh, the myocardial uh, or rather infarction, ischemic heart disease, uh, the ischemia related issues and infarction and so on and so forth. So, uh, let us uh, first discuss the uh, functional anatomy of the coronary circulation. You know, there are two coronary arteries which arise at the root of the aorta. So, if we have to draw this uh, functional anatomy of the coronary circulation, from the root of the aorta, the two coronary arteries that is uh, left and right. So, here is the right coronary artery and the left one. Well, the left coronary artery gives out a circumflex artery and then descends down on the anterior surface as the left anterior descending coronary artery. So, we have now three arteries, main arteries which are running on the anterior surface. The right coronary artery, the left one and the circumflex artery. So, they would run like this and then from the border of the heart, they would turn backward and run on the posterior wall of the heart where those three would anastomose. So, let us just show it with the broken lines that is shown on the posterior wall of the heart. They would anastomose and then their branches would penetrate deep, deeper into the myocardium. So, that is uh, about the 
मेन कॉर्नरी आर्टरीज टॉकिंग अबाउट द कैपिलरीज कैपिलरी डेंसिटी इज सेड टू बी अमंग द हाइएस्ट इन द बॉडी फॉर कॉर्नरी सर्कुलेशन एंड नेचुरली ऑब्वियसली सो हार्ट इज गोइंग टू डिराइव अ लॉट ऑफ ऑक्सीजन एंड देर फोर कैपिलरी डेंसिटी हैज गॉट टू बी हाइएस्ट वी विल सी दैट अ लिटल लेटर राइट वेल वन पॉइंट दैट आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू मैंशन एट द वेरी आउटसेट वॉज दैट वाई इज इट दैट द हार्ट हैज टू हैव इट्स ओन ब्लड सप्लाई आई हैव मैंशन इट इन द प्रीवियस वीडियो एज वेल लुक एंटायर बॉडीज ब्लड इज कमिंग इन टू द चेंबर्स ऑफ द हार्ट सो वाई डज हार्ट नीड इट्स ओन ब्लड वेसल्स देन any ways the blood is going to entire body's blood supply blood rather is going to come back into the heart chambers so why would uh, heart need a special arrangement the answer is uh, simple look heart muscle has got a certain thickness so even if entire body's blood is going to come in the chambers of the heart like this only the inner uh, let's say 75 micron thickness can actually derive nutrition uh, from this blood which has come into the chambers and look at the thickness of the heart wall or the myocardium so this entire thickness would not be able to derive or extract nutrition and oxygen from this blood and therefore a special arrangement special blood vessels are needed which we are calling as coronary circulation at the very outset uh, one must understand this right so uh, that's about the coronary circulation uh, well just one more point uh, if you look at the dominance of the arteries in the 50% or more individuals the right coronary artery is dominant in uh, about 20% individuals the left coronary artery is dominant uh, dominant by that i mean uh, it would supply major part of the heart major part of the ventricles and uh, in 30% individuals uh, both are equally dominant so 50 the right coronary artery would be dominant and uh, 20 the left anterior descending or left coronary artery let's say will be dominant and the rest 30% would be equal dominance by both coronary arteries coronary veins well most of the coronary venous blood uh, flows from the left ventricle to the right side by the way of the coronary sinus so uh, there is a coronary sinus which would uh, drain that blood venous blood from left side to the right side and then it would be drained uh, into the right side of the heart via anterior cardiac veins and of course there are also the thebaian veins that drain coronary venous blood directly into all chambers of the heart that's also unique so um, that's about the functional anatomy introduction and now let's come to the most important part for today's discussion and that is the special features of the coronary circulation so let's look at them one by one first one the normal coronary blood flow um well that's not special but let's understand these features one by one the normal coronary blood flow at rest is about 225 to 250 ml per minute and that comes out to be about 5% of the total cardiac output 4 to 5% of the total cardiac output goes in the coronary vessels or coronary blood flow at rest would be about 4 to 5% of the total cardiac output second uh arterio venous oxygen difference now that is the point which is the the core of the concept of coronary circulation 
so we must understand this particular concept extremely well arterio venous oxygen difference is highest uh, in the coronary circulation or in the heart as compared to any other organ system in the body so what is it really that we are talking about let's try to understand this uh, concept of arterio venous oxygen difference uh, look for any other tissue or organ in the body 100 ml of the arterial blood carries about 20 ml of oxygen 20 ml of oxygen carried by every 100 ml of arterial blood so let's write it here let's say this is the arterial side and uh, 20 ml uh, i'm rounding off the figures it's 20 point something 20 ml of oxygen carried by every 100 ml of arterial blood when it comes into the tissues most of the tissues most of the organs in the body under resting conditions of metabolism would extract 5 ml out of this 20 ml uh, oxygen that is coming in and that means remaining 15 ml would go back in the venous blood yeah so that's the venous side where the remaining oxygen will go which means what 5 ml out of 20 it's called as oxygen utilization coefficient 5 out of 20 that came in so that's 25 percent and the same thing is also called as arterio venous oxygen difference arterio 20 ml venous 15 ml because 5 was uh, taken out into the tissues so arterio venous oxygen difference is 5 ml and 5 on 20 that is 25 percent right so most of the organs have this uh, utilization coefficient for oxygen or arterio venous oxygen difference heart is an exception the other exception is kidneys we will talk about it later but heart in the case of myocardium and it's uh, very interesting and important to understand this in the case of coronary circulation if 20 ml of oxygen is carried by every 100 ml of uh, arterial blood by the coronary artery then the myocardium extracts 15 out of that 20 ml the myocardium extracts 15 out of the 20 ml oxygen that is coming to it look this is under resting conditions of metabolism right and therefore 5 ml will go back in the coronary vein venous blood so arterio venous oxygen difference is 15 ml and 15 out of 20 is 75 percent so heart heart muscle myocardium is extracting 75 percent of the oxygen that is coming to it under normal resting conditions of metabolism you get the point and therefore that is the problem that is the problem with the heart because look any other tissue under resting condition of metabolism is extracting only 25 percent oxygen coming to it 5 ml out of the 20 ml that comes in that means it has got the other tissues have got good oxygen reserve i mean if they need extra oxygen they can extract 10 ml 15 ml 17 18 ml they can extract more if the need be if there's a, if the need arises they can the other tissues can extract uh, more and more oxygen 
but that's not the case with heart heart is already extracting maximum oxygen coming to it 75% oxygen is already being extracted by the heart under normal resting conditions of metabolism which means it has got a poor reserve for oxygen you get the point already extracting maximum so it has got a less reserve for oxygen so when the when the oxygen need increases for the myocardium for the heart muscle for the heart tissue when its oxygen need increases and it has already extracted maximum amount of oxygen coming to it how can that extra need can be supplemented by increasing the blood flow only then more oxygen can be delivered when its need arises more oxygen can be delivered only by increasing the blood flow in the myocardium and th that's where the problem lies if the blood flow lags if it it's not uh, able to deliver that extra blood into the myocardium if the coronary circulation is inadequate to deliver the extra blood that means heart muscle will suffer it will not be able to get that extra oxygen which, is, which it is demanding and there lies the problem why uh, the heart as i said in the beginning why a condition like myocardial infarction uh, ischemic disease the uh, commonly called condition as heart attack why is it so common in this particular organ system and not in any other system uh, the reason is this uh, poor oxygen reserve even under resting conditions of metabolism so when when the metabolic need increases metabolic demand increases blood flow has to has to increase in the proportionate manner and if it doesn't then there will be a lag for oxygen so that that's very peculiar for the coronary circulation that's very peculiar for the heart muscle or myocardium so other tissues they extract only 25% oxygen coming to it to, to them heart extracts 75% oxygen coming to it under the same basal resting conditions so that's a very very crucial point and that's why we see uh, that ischemic diseases are commonest in the heart okay now uh, next the next uh, peculiar feature for the coronary circulation is that there are phasic changes in the coronary blood flow coronary blood flow shows phasic changes so two points uh, should be understood here is that uh, the first is heart receives its blood flow during diastole all other tissues in the body they would receive their blood flow mainly during systole i mean that's because left ventricle ejects the blood during systole and it will be circulated throughout the body and the tissues will receive that blood during systole but heart itself would receive its blood flow the coronary vessels would receive the blood flow mainly during diastole and uh, why is that we have already uh, seen the structure so what happens is that during systole the vessels inside the heart muscle will be compressed so it's assumed that this is a blood vessel this is just a diagrammatic representation let's say here is a blood vessel coronary vessel and when the heart goes in systole uh, it compresses the blood vessels within so this blood vessel will get compressed and the blood flow will stop and when the heart goes in diastole it expands outward so the vessel will relax and it can receive the blood flow so that's uh, unique again to the heart but this is not so simple systole diastole there are actually the phasic changes across the wall of the heart so let's understand what those changes are and therefore i mentioned the phasic changes in the coronary blood flow 
uh, first thing is that there is a tissue pressure gradient across the wall of the heart. Let us say three layers of the wall, epicardium, myocardium and endocardium. So, outer layer, then major part is the middle layer, the myocardium and then the endocardium, the inner layer. So, you see the outer layer, the epicardium or the outer uh, part of the wall, it has got certain pressure, but the middle layer has got an additional pressure. I mean pressure from the outside as well as the pressure of the outer layer of the wall. And the inner layer, the endocardium is being compressed by both the outer layers, both I mean both layers which uh, uh, outer layer and the middle layer. Point I am trying to make is that because of this there is a tissue pressure gradient that exists. Do you understand? Outer layer has a certain amount of pressure, fine. But inner layer has got additional pressure because it is being compressed by these two layers, the, epica the outer layer or the epicardium and the myocardium. These two layers are compressing the inner layer, particularly during systole. So, what happens is, now this should be understood. During systole, the endocardial vessels will be compressed during systole. Look, look at the direction of the contraction or systole. It compresses inward. So, can you imagine the inner wall is getting compressed? The inner layer is getting compressed by the outer two layers. And therefore, during systole, there would be no blood flow in the endocardium. Endocardial vessels will not have any blood flow. They are getting compressed. But there will be some blood flow in the outer layer. In the epicardial vessels, the major epicardial vessels will have some amount of blood flow during systole. They have, because that outer wall has got a lesser pressure. So, vessels will not get completely compressed. Now, diastole, the reverse will happen. The diastole means expansion of the heart, outward expansion of the heart. So, now that pressure which was exerted on the inner wall, that has, that's gone now and therefore, the endocardial vessels will open up. But, as the heart is expanding outward during diastole, the vessels in the outer wall of the heart, they will get compressed this time and no flow in the outer layer of the heart. So, you just have to imagine this, how the heart movement is occurring during systole and diastole. Systole, it is an inward compression. So, endocardial vessels will get closed, compressed, no blood flow, but there would be some blood flow in the epicardial vessels during systole. And then the diastole is expansion of the heart, the heart expands outward. So, that compression is relieved for the endocardium and there would be blood flow in the endocardial vessels during diastole, but the epicardial vessels will get compressed because the heart is uh, expanding outward during diastole. So, uh, let us summarize it, epicardial vessels, they will get the blood flow during systole and uh, endocardial vessels, they will get the blood flow during diastole. So, this is what I meant by tissue pressure gradient and its effect on the blood flow. Therefore, there are phasic changes across the wall of the heart. Now, I am going to make an important statement and the important statement is at higher heart rates, there are more chances of 
सब एंडोकार्डियल इनफार्क्ट इट हैज बीन क्लिनिकली ऑब्जर्व दैट एट हायर हार्ट रेट्स देर आर मोर एंड मोर चांसेस ऑफ सब एंडोकार्डियल इनफार्क्ट सब एंडोकार्डियल इन्फार्क्शन इज कॉमनली सीन when the heart rates are very very high why is that simple simple explanation look as the heart rates go on increasing i mean at higher heart rates the cardiac cycle duration will be shorter and shorter and shorter the heart beat is shortened and if the cardiac cycle duration is shorter that means systole and diastole both will reduce in duration yes but it's a well known fact that diastole suffers more than systole both durations are going to reduce ventricular systole ventricular diastole both durations will be less at higher heart rates because at higher heart rates the cardiac cycle is shortened so systole diastole both durations will be shortened but diastole suffers much more as compared to systole diastole duration is reduced to a much greater extent compared to systole so diastole suffers at higher heart rates and what happens during diastole we have already seen endocardium receives its blood flow during diastole so at higher heart rates diastole is going to suffer much more and therefore the endocardial blood flow is going to suffer much more and as i mentioned if the blood flow is lagging uh there are chances of ischemia and infarction as we've already seen very peculiar to the heart that it does not have any oxygen reserve as such it has to fulfill its oxygen demand by increasing the blood flow and if that does not happen uh it is uh it it's going to have that ischemic or uh infarction problem so so therefore uh that was one important aspect of coronary circulation tissue pressure gradient we have already discussed about it very peculiar that different types of blood flows in different walls of this particular organ system uh types of blood flow or uh different times at which the blood flow occurs in different walls of the same organ that's very special in the coronary circulation next let's see the next point auto regulation of the coronary blood flow auto regulation of the blood flow is another feature of course um all the vital organs they do exhibit this particular feature uh, auto regulation i mean heart can regulate its own blood supply blood flow so Uh, true is the case with uh, brain as well as kidney the vital organs they can regulate their own blood flow let me just explain this in quick time what do i mean by auto regulation look um let's say person is performing an exercise muscles would need extra blood flow now this extra blood flow has to be derived from some other part of the body because total amount of blood volume is going to remain the same of so a uh, splanchnic blood flow blood flow in the git would be diverted to the skeletal muscle or maybe blood flow from the skin will be diverted to the skeletal muscle that means these organs were not in complete command of their own blood flows their blood flow was not being regulated by themselves there was there is a sympathetic nervous system which will cause vasodilation in the skeletal muscle but vasoconstriction in the splanchnic blood uh, in the splanchnic circulation so blood flow will be diverted from the splanchnic circulation to the skeletal muscle so someone else was controlling this blood flow someone else was regulating in this case uh, which uh, the example that i gave it was sympathetic nerves which were controlling it but in the case of heart brain and kidney they can regulate their own blood flow so that's a very peculiar feature and it's called as auto regulation and it's the most important feature i mean imagine if some other organ was needing extra blood and coronary 
vessels were to divert uh, their blood to the other organs obviously it would be catastrophic so vital organs should never be deprived of their quota of blood well uh, there are a few hypotheses how this uh, auto regulation occurs the local metabolism is the one which regulates the blood flow in the coronary vessels there is a bernays hypothesis for this let's just see with a diagrammatic representation what it means the bernays hypothesis that is let's say if the heart rate increases that means it is going to need extra blood flow and extra oxygen supply how is it that it uh, it de derives extra blood flow for itself how it regulates its own blood flow is that if there is increased heart rate that means increased metabolism increased metabolism or increased metabolic rate of the myocardium and increased metabolism means increased atp breakdown and as the atp uh, breaks down there would be adp formation then amp and finally what remains is adenosine and uh, one must know that adenosine is a very very important vasodilator in most uh, vascular beds it causes vasodilation so this adenosine will leak out of the cell and it will induce vasodilation locally as the vessels will dilate locally the blood flow will increase so that's how uh, locally by increased metabolism and increased formation of adenosine uh, the blood flow can be increased whenever there is a need whenever there is a demand for that so uh, auto regulation that's uh, a very very important feature for the coronary circulation nervous uh, supply neural regulation of the coronary blood flow the coronary vessels are influenced by sympathetic nerves mainly the sympathetic nerves act through two types of receptors alpha and beta alpha receptors you know mediate vasoconstriction and beta receptors mediate vasodilation and the most important point epicardial coronary vessels they mainly have alpha receptors and endocardial coronary vessels they mainly have beta receptors so sympathetic stimulation will have this dual effect on the coronary circulation on the coronary blood flow what is the dual effect when there is increased sympathetic discharge when there is sympathetic stimulation the alpha receptors in the epicardial coronary vessels they will mediate vasoconstriction but at the same time beta receptors present in the endocardial vessels will mediate vasodilation so uh, it's kind of a dual response by sympathetic stimulation however the overall effect if i were to say the overall effect of sympathetic stimulation the net effect the net result uh, leans toward coronary vasoconstriction okay so please understand this i mentioned two receptors they are going to mediate uh, different effects but the net effect is if you, if i were to say what is the net effect of sympathetic stimulation on coronary blood flow it's going to be a reduction in the coronary coronary blood flow because it's going to cause coronary vasoconstriction uh let's see some other features quickly energy metabolism of the heart again something unique here uh most of the uh, most other organs in the body they are primary users of glucose or carbohydrate their energy production their atp synthesis is is primarily linked to the carbohydrate glucose is the major fuel for energy major source for atp 
production for most of the other organs in the body. Brain, an obligate user for glucose. But heart is an exception. How is that? A heart does not use glucose as the primary source of energy. It uses free fatty acids as the primary source. More than 70% of the energy uh, is derived by the myocardium derives more than 70% of its energy by using the free fatty acids, non-esterified fatty acids, NEFA or free fatty acids. And only about 25 to 30% energy is derived from the glucose. 3% by the other remaining sources. But major chunk of energy comes from lipids and not carbohydrates. That's again very unique. Please remember this. All other organ systems in the body, most of the other organ systems, the tissues, they are the primary users of glucose and carbohydrates. Heart is the exception. So these are some of the important, important features of coronary circulation and with that let's now see the applied uh, physiology related to the coronary circulation. Basically it's the coronary artery diseases and uh, uh, what happens is these coronary arteries they when they are unable to supply the required oxygen then it results in this category of diseases, coronary artery diseases and as I mentioned along with the hypertension, the coronary artery diseases along with the hypertension must be the uh, I think second largest uh, fatal conditions uh, or uh, killer diseases worldwide, globally, particularly in the affluent societies as I mentioned. Right, so basically there are uh, two types of these coronary artery diseases. One is called as angina or angina pectoris and the other one is myocardial infarction. I am going to take one more video on these particular topics because they are not uh, that simple to understand. A video will follow as a follow-up video on this. But let me just give you a brief idea about these two diseases. Uh, what is angina? Now basically, there is a fine balance between oxygen demand and oxygen supply. So, there is a fine balance. Now, if the oxygen supply lags, due to a variety of reasons. Normally, the balance is tilted in the favor of oxygen supply. And we have seen the reason. Normally, uh, myocardium extracts a lot of oxygen already under the resting conditions of metabolism. And lot of oxygen is made available. Well, let me just uh, add here. Why does heart need uh, such an excessive amount of oxygen even under basal conditions of metabolism. Other tissues are extracting 25% oxygen coming to it, coming to them. Heart is extracting 75% of the total oxygen coming to it. I mean, why? Reason is obvious. Heart is continuously contracting. It will require uh, a greater amount of energy production. That's one. And second is heart is utilizing lipids, lipid stores for energy production and lipids are never burnt anaerobically. They would always be metabolized aerob aerobically, I beg your pardon. And because it's an aerobic metabolism, they would require a heavy amount of oxygen. So please remember that's very unique about the heart. Now this is the balance tilted in the favor of oxygen supply normally. Now, if this balance gets tilted the other way around, that the oxygen need has increased, but supply is inadequate, then the heart will suffer. And uh, that is when it results in the angina. So, angina is chest pain on exertion. To be precise, it's a chest pain 
and the chest pain typically comes with exertion and that's because of this particular aspect oxygen supply has been lagging so what really happens is since there is no oxygen supply there would be anaerobic metabolism in that region in a particular particular region of the heart anaerobic metabolism would obviously generate lactic acid and this lactic acid leaks out of the cells leaks out of the myocardial cells and irritates the nerve endings in that region let's say here is a heart wall and here is the innervation the nerve fibers carrying pain so now what has happened is uh, anaerobic metabolism has ensued anaerobic metabolism has occurred in this uh, particular region oxygen supply was not forthcoming so lactic acid was generated by these cells lactic acid leaks out of the cells and irritates the nerve endings in the vicinity and that causes the chest pain so this is the reason uh, given for the uh, chest pain in angina and chest pain that occurs with exertion and it is relieved by rest typically it would occur by exertion because exertion um, would heart muscle would demand extra oxygen uh, and then uh, it would be relieved by rest because again the balance will be tilted in the favor of oxygen supply so that's angina the chest pain which can be relieved by rest or by the particular medicines like nitroglycerin we will discuss about it uh, in the follow up video and the other is myocardial infarction well this again is a big big topic myocardial infarction in itself would require one or two videos so uh, i would just take a few important aspects the myocardial infarction generally occurs due to the atherosclerosis of one or more coronary arteries so most common cause is said to be the atherosclerosis of the coronary vessels uh, we are talking about ischemic heart diseases what happens is because of the atherosclerosis because of the plaque formation slowly but surely the uh, particular area of the heart will be deprived of its blood supply and oxygen supply and eventually what will happen is this is just a diagrammatic representation atherosclerosis a plaque is forming and forming and forming eventually that plaque will uh, occlude or rather block the vessel completely and that is when a particular part of the heart will not get oxygen there would be ischemia necrosis cell death and finally the area uh, uh, of that region or that uh, area of the heart would die which is called as infarction so these are the sequential terms that we use ischemia necrosis is the term used for the cells cellular death and then a region which is affected because of that is the infarction so myocardial infarction occurs because of atherosclerosis of the vessels whereas i mean how the coronary uh, angina or angina pectoris different from this is that in case of angina pectoris there can be a temporary vasospasm the coronary vessels can show a temporary vasospasm which can be relieved at rest so uh, the chest pain relieves uh, chest pain is relieved in the case of myocardial infarction once it starts evolving then it is an urgency it's an emergency it has to be treated within that golden hour otherwise the heart muscle cannot be saved so there are lots of uh, lines of treatments uh, which which we will discuss in the subsequent videos but that's uh, the coronary artery disease basically the two types of diseases 
the angina and myocardial infarction. But what I wanted you to focus on is that why is it that the heart is the biggest sufferer of this type of diseases? Is that arteriovenous oxygen difference or oxygen utilization coefficient is highest in the case of heart and therefore it has got poor reserves for oxygen unlike the other tissues which have a good reserve for oxygen under normal resting uh, metabolic conditions. So that was very key feature which I wanted to highlight and these are the things that uh, uh, you must understand about the coronary circulation. In the subsequent videos we will discuss about these diseases in detail.